It's wonderful to be here. And um, I would like to start by saying that I think we can only move forward uh, with you know uh, the research in, in the area of leaf romani syndrome if we do it together with the families and the affected uh, individuals. And therefore, I think it's so great that so many are here today. Um, and I'm also proud to be the new chair in Germany of the newly founded LFSA Germany branch. So uh, we just have, uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit a little later. So I'm a pediatric oncologist and I'm very interested um, in syndromes that predispose to cancer. And the reason is simple. I, it's the only really known cause of childhood cancer. Therefore, I find it so relevant. And today we believe that um, at least 10% of all children with cancer have an underlying genetic um, predisposition. And more important for this meeting today, um, of the 100 genes that are in this 10%, p53 is the most relevant. And there's a recent study um, uh, published in Nature um, from the German group, and uh, or by the German group, and they estimated that 1.5% uh, of all cases of childhood cancer uh, are due to a germline mutation of p53. So in Germany, we have 2,100 cases of cancer each year. That means that there are 300 cases or children with cancer who have an underlying germline mutation of, of p53. Why is it relevant to identify these patients? It's so relevant because it matters in terms of therapy, surveillance, risk reduction or, pre or prevention, and family counseling. Uh, counseling. And if you don't recognize it, you just deliver the regular therapy for these individuals. The problem in Germany, I told you earlier that we have 2,000, roughly 2,000 cases. We have too many centers. In Holland, right now, they only have one center. We have 60. And uh, that uh, is good for the families that don't have to travel so far. However, I'm pretty sure that not many physicians know about Lifromini syndrome. And in order to increase the awareness, uh, Stefan Pfister, his name was uh, came up often already earlier, and I have recently founded a cancer predisposition working group um, just to increase um, the care for these individuals, um, uh, children with cancer who have an underlying predisposition. And one of the first and low-hanging fruits was to make sure that the obvious cases would be recognized. And what do I mean by obvious? Um, I mean obvious in terms of the family history, which was frequently overlooked, the histology, for example, uh, adrenocortical carcinoma or choroid plexus carcinoma, you have to test for leaf romani syndrome. The somatic signature, um, David gave a, the, the example of chromotrypsis in medulloblastoma. Um, and the physical features. And we have um, adopted um, a Dutch, um, or cha changed a little bit a Dutch form and have created a one-page questionnaire. And all centers that are certified for pediatric oncology are now required to use this form for each new patient just to make sure they find those who have an obvious uh, cancer predisposition syndrome. The problem here is um, obvious too because it only looks for the obvious cases. The hidden cases are by def definition overlooked using this form. And this is a big problem because many um, cases of cancer predisposition in children with cancer, they don't have a positive fa family history. They are basically hidden. Uh, I, and therefore, I'm uh, very convinced that within the next few years, we will have agnostic tests for all patients when they are newly diagnosed. Um, and i ju just give you one example why this is so relevant from the brain tumor field. There's a, a recent paper that came out, and David was one of the major players on that paper too, in Lancet on Oncology. It's about um, medulloblastoma. And this, this paper showed that out of uh, the older or 25% of the, uh, the older children with sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma aged 5 to 14 years have an underlying germline mutation of p53, 25%. And another 20% of the younger children 
uh, up to, um, or below the age of three with sonic heterog um, medulloblastoma have an underlying germline mutation of SUFU. And yet another 7% of patients with wind-activated medulloblastoma have a germline mutation of APC. And most of these patients uh, were cryptic. So they were not identified clinically. They were only identified by sequencing. And therefore, I've, I, this is a nice example why this is so relevant. And we are currently planning a study uh, to convince the um, insurance companies to pay um, um, the sequencing up front by comparing the clinical and the agnostic testing and just to show that we would miss many of these patients by just using the clinical easy survey. And I'm convinced that when we identify uh, the patients that have a syndrome and we are able to do um, or, or to uh, uh, um, individualize the treatment, conduct surveillance, and so on, we will save so much money that we can easily pay for the sequencing. But we will also look for the costs in the study and also conduct a psychosocial assessment. The surveillance in Germany, um, we recommend it in a quite simple manner. We simply use the AACR guidelines. And, but we are aware of the fact that um, the guidelines, uh, they have been talked about many times already today, um, they will change over time. And I'm very happy um, that there is so much going on right now um, that they will eventually change so they can be adapted according to risk. Right now, this is not the case. So whenever you have um, make recommendations like uh, surveillance for all the different syndromes, it's important to also create data to see whether it's effective or not. And for that purpose, Stefan Fister and I have recently launched um, a registry for patients with leaf romani syndrome in Germany. And because leaf romani syndrome is not alone, there are 100 other genes uh, beside P53 and 60 other syndromes and it wouldn't be uh, effective to open 60 um, different registry. We just um, decided to open one registry, a cancer-prone syndrome registry, and that um, patients with germline mutations of various genes and, oops. So we decided to put every, all the syndromes into one protocol, the cancer syndrome protocol. Um, and so what we have also done is um, to create um, a platform, an information platform. And this information platform um, is called, I mean, I just continue, it doesn't really matter. It's called FIT, it's call, uh, which stands for Facts in, um, and Investigation Therapy. It has um, information on 60 different syndromes for all the families, so very easy to understand, on all the 60 syndromes uh, for professionals and also information uh, on different tumors. And then you can click on the different tumor types and you can see the syndromes that are associated with these uh, tumor types. So it really helps um, for the daily practice um, for families and for professionals to learn in a very efficient, fast way about these uh, syndromes. And w uh, the website is cancer-predisposition.org. And um, we are currently translating it in different languages. We started in German, the next language is English, but then we will go to different languages. We do have DTAs, data transfer agreements and material transfer agreements with other registries in place. Um, for example, with the registry of the LIFE consortium. I think it would be also very important to have, to be able to talk uh, with the um, uh, the French uh, registry because, I mean, we need to work together with the families and the different registries um, in order to move forward more quickly in a more efficient manner and not to do a Me Too initiative. We have to really work together. And for that reason, we had recently a meeting in Brussels uh, because we want to uh, somehow in Europe to incorporate all the different various activities, the, the the, from the various registries and have a joint data collection within Europe. And um, this is likely to happen under the umbrella of uh, SIOP. And this will also include Israel as well. And we just had a first meeting recently in, in Brussels. 
And uh, there's a nice picture that I cannot show you, but tell you about, about all the people who are standing at Brussels airport. <laughs> so the last um, topic is the treatment part. And the treatment part is a little bit embarrassing because we, I mean, there's a lot happening right now, but despite the fact that uh, Lee syndrome was discovered 50 years ago, we are still not diagnosing all patients and we don't know really how to treat them. And um, and the problem is very simple. Now we can we can see it again. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The problem is very simple. Conventional chemotherapy and radiation therapy tries to or destroys DNA, and that leads to apoptosis of tumor cells. And that requires p53 in order to happen. And in patients with Lefranini syndrome. Um, there is likely to be more toxicity, for example, um, second, secondary neoplasm, and there is more likely to be resistant. Um, I think it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, there's likely to be more resistance, and the resistance is very easy to understand because um, the, the tumors require uh, p53 in order to die with chemotherapy. And therefore, we need new ways to treat these uh, patients. And this is not, a, and by the way, not only true for all patients with Lefromini syndrome. This is very, very similar in many other disorders with an um, abnormal DNA damage response. There are different diseases, including dyskeratosis, including Fanconi anemia, um, including no, you took it away from me here. <laughs> so many there. There's a range of um, conditions uh, that have an abnormal DNA damage response, and they all all these conditions, uh, including nine wing breakage, Werner syndrome, ligase, uh, ligase four deficiency, mismatch repair deficiency, seroderma pigmentosum. They all have a tremendous risk of developing cancer, uh, and yet. We don't really know how to treat patients with cancer because they are, have such a high rate of toxicity. And for that reason, uh, we are um, creating a new project right now in, in Germany called ADDRESS. And ADDRESS stands for Abnormal DNA Damage Response. And uh, this is um, something that can really only work with the families because we require the families to, to work uh, together with the registries, with the physicians. Otherwise, um, the tumors that we can study in order to um, discover new treatment options, there are somehow lost in the different hospitals. And we really need every single patient to collaborate here in order to be very, very efficient. Because the idea is to take every tumor that arises in a person with Lefromani syndrome, bring it into the lab, create a, a mouse model with these patients uh, or with these um, tumors and treat them um, ex vivo and try to find uh, therapies that, that work in the mice and then after identifying new therapies, bring them into clinical trials. And I think in this type of work, the, the families and the family organizations are really the key because it wouldn't work without them. And for that reason, I, I'm very convinced that um, the, the progress of the field um, in Lefromini syndrome wouldn't be happening so efficiently without organizations like the Lefromini Association. And um, I was very honored um, two years ago when um, Jen Perry, I think she's going to speak during this meeting also, um, and Holly Fromini approached me and we were um, able to to launch um, a branch now in Germany. We recently had a first uh, Lee from Any meeting, which was very similar to this one here, um, a first LFSA Germany branch meeting. And here are some nice pictures. I can tell you and can describe them. Uh, a very, very nice group picture of the families. We also went to the zoo and, and saw the elephants, uh, which was inspired by Josh Schiffman's work on elephant P53. And we had a fantastic time. I think um, at that point I would like to finish. It's also a little bit difficult without <laughs> projector, but no problem. And um, I would like to thank all the members of the live consortium. Many of them are here today. Especially I would like to thank Thierry for your very 
um, kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here today. I would very much also like to, uh, to thank Jen Perry and Holly Fromini. Um, they are the drivers from the uh, patient side and without their power, I think many things just wouldn't happen. And, and I'm very thrilled that now there's also be, uh, going to be a chapter here in, in um, this country. It's going to be um, very nice. And I look forward to collaborating closely with, uh, with you. And um, finally, here is a picture of my team. Uh, very nice people, very good looking people. <laughs> and um, thank you for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here. Bye. So sorry for the technical problem. So what I decided to do is to make the break. So we're going to fix it. And after that, you are going to show the slides, especially with your team, because that's very important, right? So we <laughs> change the program and we make the break yeah, right now in order to fix for the last speakers. Yeah. Um, I think what is very impressive is what the registry, right? So my question to come back to the patient. So um, as what we are doing, because this morning was a discussion, and uh, uh, Laurence uh, nicely addressed a question. Uh, which type of patient should we test? So at the present time, um, so in Germany, uh, are you systematically offering German IPv3 testing for children presenting the typical uh, LFS tumors that you know very well? Right. Or are you going to systematically offer German line to other indication? So right now it's um, the first. So we just, we, so in the, until, until just five years ago, the adrenal cortical carcinomas were not tested, and the choroid plexus carcinomas were not tested because it was just simply ignored. I mean, we know from uh, the work from uh, Sharon Savage that um, roughly 10% of osteosarcoma uh, patients uh, have a, a variant, and but when you ask the guy who runs the osteosarcoma registry, he doesn't know any patient with lipromini in his his um, red, uh, the osteosarcoma registry. So. It was simply ignored until, despite the fact that so much is already known. And now we are, so what uh, we are doing now, we tested for all the obvious ones, the um, choroid plexus yeah. and the hyperdiploid ALL and so on, and the sonic hedgehog medullus. So that's the case right now. And we do it very consequently. And by doing so, we, we pick up a ma uh, many. And then we also have another thing in Germany that's called the INFORM study that is run by Stefan Pfister. And they sequence all the uh, relapse cases of cancer, independent of the diagnosis, and they pick up a lot of um, uh, variant carriers also. Uh, so they will be included in the registry also. And um, because there is also no registry for adults, we will also include adult pay, um, cases in the registry as well. So in other words, like in different countries, is, is there is a need to diffuse information. I think right. there's a request from the passion side, also from as right. professional that probably many people, especially people working in uh, MRI, radiology, and oncology, are not very right. familiar with that. And, and I think this is a, the big problem, uh, um, that we are not really advanced in the therapy. Um, we are very advanced in Down syndrome because it's written on the forehead that you have Down syndrome. You can easily diagnose this. In Lee syndrome, it was ignored for the last five decades. Therefore, we have to do our homework starting now because we have no clue how they do uh, compared to the other ones. So we need to consequently diagnose them, and then we have to do trials for patients with Lee syndrome. syndrome. Okay. So yeah. I will propose, uh, since we are lucky, we have... Uh, you know, f don't worry about my slides. Yeah, I mean, it's, we need to move forward with the time. So it, it really, I don't, I don't really mind. So that's our team. That's our team. <laughs> See, <laughs> yes, you have two seconds to present them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. So yeah. So that's our lovely, lovely team. <laughs>